Welcome to the Amada installation, maintenance, and service video. In this video, we will show how to unwrap, inspect, and install your machine. We will go over general maintenance and the usage of each station. Please note that you must inspect your machine prior to the truck leaving. The first part of this video will show you how to unwrap and inspect your machine prior to the truck leaving. The truck has just arrived with your new Spartan iron worker. Please use a crane or a forklift to unload the machine. With the cover and packaging still in place, we want to do a visual inspection all around the machine, checking for any damage to the packaging or the machine. You will notice that there are several stickers on the machine. One is to indicate checking the machine for any damage. The other is to indicate that the machine is top heavy when lifting it. There are also four bolts securing the machine to the pallet, one in each corner. Next, we will cut the strap securing the electric back gauge to the front of the machine. We will then remove the back gauge and take it to the back of the machine for installation. We will cut our foot pedal strap and then take the foot pedal and place it on the floor. We will then take the green toolbox with our punches and dies and place that to the side. After the inspection is completed, you will notice that you have a toolbox with the machine. It has an orange or yellow top. It holds the keys to both the sheet metal and the electrical box. You will find both your keys in the toolbox. The square one you use for your sheet metal and you will be using that in a moment. The one with the ears on it you will open your electrical box. Inside the electrical box, you will find your breather cap and your manuals and punch and die information. Now we will move to the back of the machine. We are going to remove our drop guard that is secured with two Allen head cap screws. Place this guard off to the side. We will now take our square key and rotate the locks to remove the sheet metal on the back of the machine. We will remove the sheet metal and we will place that off to the side. As you can see, the little red plastic cap, that will need to be removed and your breather cap put on the machine to replace it. We use the red plastic cap in order to ship the machine so we don't get hydraulic oil all over the machine. In this particular cabinet, we will have the sight glass for hydraulic oil, the breather cap, hydraulic pressure gauge, valve body, hydraulic pump, motor, and cartridge oil filter. Now that we put our breather cap on the machine, we will take our square key and re-secure the sheet metal to the machine. That step is now completed. The drop guard now needs to be put back in position using the two Allen head cap screws that we initially took off. Once we have secured our drop guard, we will be returning to the front of the machine. Now let us examine the various components in our electrical cabinet. We have our power source, our relays, our overload, our three main fuses, and the area where we will be inputting power into the machine. Your machine is set up for 230 volt power. The third hole is used for 460 volt power. Power being brought to the machine should be done by a licensed, bonded, insured contractor. The next step will be removing the panel below the electrical box. Unscrew both screws securing that panel and remove it. We will then need to feed our wire through the machine after we remove the knockout plug. We've removed our knockout plug. We will set it down and now we will feed our wires through this portion of the knockout plug. We will then feed it back into the machine and secure the top portion. Now that we've secured our lines coming into the machine, we will now use a very small screwdriver to insert our wires into the receptacle. We will need to push the small screwdriver into the top portion of the receptacle and then slide the wires in. You will need to do this to lines one, two, and three, and the ground, which is the green wire, will go in the yellow and green receptacle. We will then do a pull test on each of the lines. If the machine runs backwards, you will need to change lines one and two, as shown here, to reverse the motor. This is a three-phase motor, and it can be run forward or backward, but the machine will not operate without the proper rotation. You might not need to switch lines one and two. You'll need to start the machine first to see if it has proper rotation before switching them. This was just showing you how to do it if the machine does not run the proper direction. We will now reinstall the bottom panel with the two screws that we removed. We will simply reinstall the screws and now we have our electrical complete. We will now lock our electrical box up and place the key back in our toolbox. 
We will then take any one of the four selector switch keys, which are black, and place them into the machine. You will only need two keys to do this. We supply an additional two. The outside of the electrical panel consists of your main power switch. The white light tells you your power's on. The green light is your push button to start. The red button is your push button to stop. The mushroom button next to that one is your emergency stop. Down below, you have jog and normal, working and automatic, shear and notch, and lights on and off. The machine is 233 phase. You will then plug it into the wall or have it hardwired into the electrical panel. That is completely up to your electrician. Remember, all Amata machines are 233 phase, except if you buy a 460 conversion kit. Now that we have power to the machine and we know what our buttons and selector switches do, we will now check for rotation of the motor to make sure it is running in the right direction. If the motor is running correctly when stepping on the foot pedal, the machine should go up and down. If it does not, we need to change wires one and two of your power input. The foot pedal has a safety that needs to push in while depressing the foot pedal. When you depress the foot pedal, the machine goes down and cuts the material. When you let off the foot pedal, the machine will retract into the up position. If you let halfway up on the foot pedal, the machine will stop in any position you desire. You have a stainless steel strain relief coming out of the foot pedal and a stainless steel strain relief coming out of the machine. Now let's start to examine the functionality of each station on the machine. We will start with the punch. This machine has two stripper plates and a swing away stripper. The stripper plates are used for larger and smaller holes. When we're removing the stripper plate, you simply take out both Allen head cap screws and the plate will fall out of the stripper. Then place the other stripper plate up into the casting and re-secure it with your Allen head cap screws. That completes your stripper plate change. Now let's take a look at the punch and die. In this step, we will be showing how to align the punch and die in the die block. First, take the die, make sure that the small hole is on top, the large hole is on the bottom, and place it into the die block. Tighten the Allen head set screw until it is tight. We will then take the punch and put it through our series 55 sleeve and place it into the die. We will then put our selector switch to jog. We will then move the ram of the machine down by depressing the foot pedal so that the coupling nut gets very close to the punch. We will then take the ears of the sleeve and place it into the nut while we tighten it with our spanner wrench after snugging it by hand, making sure we have equal clearance around the punch. We can now shut our stripper door. We have now successfully aligned our punch and die. Now we can begin our punching operation. The punch and die should already be aligned at the factory. We want to check the alignment by checking if there's equal clearance of the die all around the punch. You can now shut your stripper door. Now place the machine in punch with the selector switch. You are now ready to punch. You should have a nice hole with no burr on either side of the material. To punch angle iron, you must remove the front part of your gauging table with a wrench. Once you have taken the front part of the gauging table off, you can now punch angle iron. You will also notice that there is clearance under the die for the punching of C-channel. That is the area where the bottom leg will go. That concludes our punching operation. Now let's move on to the next station. We will now move onto the flat bar shear. Notice the adjustment knob on top of the guard. This will raise and lower the guard so the material does not kick back up on the operator. This guard needs to be set just above the material to achieve the best cut. This is the flattest flat bar shear in the industry. Notice there is no deformation, curling, or curving. Now let's move on to the next station. The same adjustment knob that raises and lowers the flat bar shear guard raises and lowers the angle iron shear guard. We have a crop off dial angle iron shear and we have no material loss when cutting either equal or unequal leg angle iron. For mitering angle iron, bottom leg only, you can use the flat bar shear. Simply put the material into the flat bar shear through the center slot and push until the top leg makes contact with the top blade. Set whatever angle you want and step on your foot pedal. It will miter bottom leg only angle iron. 
Now let's move on to the next station. The round and square bar shear is raised and lowered by the same adjustment knob as the flat bar shear and angle iron shear. When shearing round or square bar, the guard must come down and hit the material so it does not flex back on the operator. There is minimal deformation on the round and square bar material. To remove the cover on the shear station, simply remove the four Allen head cap screws as shown and the guard will come off and so will the two mounting blocks behind the shear cover. After taking the guard off, you can place channel shear blades, T-bar, Z-bar, or other shapes that you require. Custom knives are available. Now let's move on to the notcher station. The selector switch must be turned to notch. If the selector switch is still in the shear position, the notcher will not operate. The guard can be positioned in any of the slots. When raised, it pushes a safety roller in. Now the notcher can operate. The light will flash to let the operator know that the door on the notcher station is open. When the operator puts the guard down, the light will stop flashing. Now let's do some notching. We can cut our angle iron to make a frame. We can cut flat bar. We can cut the middle of angle iron. Any cut you wanna make, as long as it's under the capacity of the machine, you can put it in the notcher and make a cut. Now that we've concluded our notcher, let's move to our back gauge. We will now remove the bolts from the frame of the machine. These bolts are used to attach the electric back gauge. We will set them right next to us within easy reach because we will need them to secure the back gauge. Now that the bolts have been removed, we will be installing the back gauge. We want to make sure that the wire goes through the slot. This is very, very important as you do not want to pinch the wire off the back gauge. We will now put the bolts back into the frame of the machine to secure the back gauge. This is one half of your electric back gauge which you are securing. The other half we will be securing in a moment. We will now connect the electrical portion of the back gauge. It can go two ways. If it does not go in easily the first way, turn it 180 degrees and it will easily snap in. Do not force it. We will now be putting the cross arm portion of the back gauge onto the machine. First, we must remove the safety nut and bolt. We will then be sliding that portion of the back gauge through the support area. And now we will reinstall the safety nut and bolt. This will keep that portion of the back gauge from sliding out of the support area. Let's review the back gauge. We've already mounted the back gauge. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna slide the bar forward, looking at the inlaid scale for the length of our part. We have two handles which secure the back gauge into position. The bottom handle is used to position the back gauge for the length of the part. Now we are securing it after reviewing where on the bar we want to be. The top handle positions the back gauge to any of the stations and puts it in the correct position to make the part. The nose of the back gauge is angled down. What we want to do is put the material underneath the circle and in the down position with the nose, the material will sweep away with the action of the machine. It won't bind and get stuck. It must be in this position. If it's above the circle, it'll probably get stuck. We don't want that. The threads on the back gauge also allow for very fine tuning of the length of the part. If it's too long, we would rotate the nose of the back gauge clockwise to make the part shorter. If the part is too short, we will rotate back gauge nose counterclockwise to make it longer. Our original part was an eighth of an inch too long. So after repositioning the nose of the back gauge using our thread, we made a perfect cut and have a perfect length. Let's move on to the stroke controls. The stroke control limits how far the hydraulic cylinder can move up and down. Therefore, how far up and down the machine will actually go. The top stroke control limits how far down the machine will go. The bottom stroke control controls how far up the machine will go. As you can see behind the cover, there are two micro switches and two stroke controls. When the stroke control hits a micro switch, it stops the machine, either moving up or down. It's as simple as that. When you move the stroke control, you can limit how far up or down, the machine will go. We will now move on to the lubrication system. The lubrication system uses a customer's grease gun and the Zerk fittings that are on the machine. The machine should be lubricated every 40 working hours. Simply take a good lithium grease and apply it to each of the Zerk fittings. As you can see, there are quite a few contact points for your grease gun. You must hit every one of them. Please do not put any material in your iron worker that is harder than the blades. Stainless steel is fine, mild steel is fine, 
non-ferrous material is fine. Do not put hard ox into your machine. Do not put AR plate into your machine. Do not put spring steel into your machine. These materials are hard and can damage or break your machine. In your electrical cabinet, you will find a manila envelope. It will have your manual, your schematics, and your punch and die catalog. If you would like additional punch and die information, you can get that from your local dealer or contact Cleveland Punch and Die directly. We do not give this catalog with the machine, but you can get it from your local dealer or Cleveland Direct. That concludes our installation, maintenance, and service video. Please see our other videos for more in-depth look at stations, accessories, and other service-related items.